Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's Fish Tank. Um, we'll be talking about the reopening of schools on the 1st of June. Uh, we are very excited to have educationists, teachers, school principals with us on the call tonight uh, to discuss uh, people's thoughts on the reopening, uh, thoughts on the practical implementation of the plans, um, and, and also fears around returning to school. So we are very excited to have this panel together. Just before I introduce the panel, um, I'd just like to give you a bit of a brief background about the Education Fish Tank. We are a group of young people who care about and are interested in education. And we um, usually, under normal circumstances, organize a monthly or bi-monthly talk in Cape Town about various education issues. Our main aim is to get people talking about education. We want our talks to be as accessible as possible to anyone, whether you have an education background or not. And we want bring, to bring people who care about education together. Today is our first uh, online fish tank. We've been wanting to do this for a while. And now the current circumstances have forced us to implement that plan. Um, so we're excited to see how it goes. Kyan and Helian are two team members who are behind the screens trying to coordinate all the technology and the comments and things. And Ashley, who's on our panel tonight, also helps organize education fish tank events. So that's the education fish tank. I'm going to get us right into the conversation. But first, just to introduce our pan panelists for tonight. Uh, we've got Patricia Tace uh, on the line. She's a newly qualified PGE graduate in life science and natural sciences from UCT. And she's also worked in various public schools through her practical and also as a tutor. Um, then we've got Ashley Fasahi. Ashley runs the NGO Bottom Up, uh, which works in under-resourced schools in Cape Town. Um, he, and he's also busy with his PhD in education at UCT. Uh, Bevel Levinsky is a principal at Southfield Primary School. Um, and he's also part of the Provincial Principals Forum. He says he's got 26 years of teaching uh, behind him. So he's got a lot of experience to talk about. And then finally, we've also got Anushka Daniels, who's the acting deputy principal at Swansvake High School. Um, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for joining us. We are super excited to hear your thoughts. To get us started, I'm going to ask just for your initial thoughts on the reopening of schools on the 1st of January, um, do you think it's possible? What, uh, what are your feelings about it? What are your concerns? I'm going to ask Anushka if you can maybe start us off. Uh, sure, Rene, thank you. Uh, and hi to whoever is possibly watching. I realize my principal. Um, has shared this link with the entire management team. So it's going to be an awkward conversation when I see them again on Monday. But um, yeah, thanks for having me. So I, yeah, so I, I think, and I speak a lot about schools reopening and just the functionality of schools in general. And I think June 1st is an interesting date, but I'm also recognizing that from the Minister of Education, my personal opinion is that uh, Dr. Angie Mochecha has just been so insistent about schools needing to reopen. Uh, I'm sure everybody saw her address to us on, I think it was Tuesday evening, where she's just promoting and, and pro propagating the idea that schools need to open, you know, come hell or high water. And there's been quite a lot in the circles that I occupy, contention regarding that kind of comment. But I've tried very hard to think about the three primary perspectives, I, I think, that have shaped why schools need to reopen. And so I think I'm looking at what I'm calling the, the role players in these kinds of decisions. So the first perspective I want, to, I want to touch on a little bit is the perspective that comes from the school. Um, a lot of the schools in my area, I'm in Metro South in Cape Town, a lot of the schools in my area 
have been struggling with the uh, intake of school fees, which of course is a very natural thing. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's something that we rely heavily upon the parents to actually pay. And with the lockdown being imposed, a lot of schools are not getting in adequate school fees to be able to pay salaries and, and those kinds of things. So something that's kind of worrying for a lot of schools in my circuit is how are schools going to be able to operate, uh, operate I beg your pardon, during the lockdown if they're not getting adequate school fees in? It means that staff can't get paid, that lights and water can't be paid as well. And it's a big concern that they have. So I'm recognizing from a school's perspective, and that's the first perspective I speak about, there is quite a lot of onus on schools needing to open in order to almost justify that school fees need to be paid. And then on the other hand, I'm looking at the perspective of, of the parents and the learners, um, the community that I serve, and I believe fundamentally that schools must serve the people that make up your population. Um, so the, the school that I serve, um, the parent body that I, I work with on a daily basis, you know, regarding what they, their feelings are regarding school opening, it's a, it's a funny one because a lot of them are like, my child needs to finish high school, I'm a high school teacher. And a lot of what the parents are, is they're looking at their child fulfilling and moving on to other aspects of their child's life. Um, a lot of the parent body is also quite a bit um, older than what I am. So a lot of their children are probably the eldest that they have in their families. So a concern that I think parents in my community probably have with schools opening on the 1st of June is if their child at my high school is their eldest child, who's going to look after their, their second child or their second eldest child or their third eldest child and those kinds of things. And so there's that really interesting contradictory narrative that exists between schools reopening and parents being unable to go back to work, or in some cases, parents having to go to work, their elder child, their matric child in this case, for June the 1st, going back to school. What happens to the other learners and the other children in their home that very often the children I work with are, are caregivers of? And then, and this is probably my favorite one, but I can almost try to understand why DBE is pushing for schools to open as well. Um, something I spend a lot of time doing with the learners that I work with is engaging with access to higher education. And it's been a, a sore spot because a lot of my children can't necessarily afford higher education. So I, I work quite closely with them in accessing bursaries and those kinds of things. But something that's pretty cool about uh, being a high school teacher is suddenly with the release of the grade 12 result at the end of the year or in early January of next year, suddenly everybody has something to say about education and the state and the quality of education in our country. And so I can understand why DBE is also quite um, pushing quite a lot for schools to open again, because they probably try in some way to give a credibility to the grade 12 results. And I think that's largely why MBTs and those kinds of tests come in for higher education, because a lot of what the quality of the grade 12 result is perceived to be is some sort of questionable pass rate. Um, that gives rise to a child at the end of a trick getting it. So those are the three perspectives I spend a lot of time thinking about. And I think those are probably shaping my view on education and schools reopening. And I think just to, to finish off for you, uh, Renee, I think to finish off, I think my strongest perspective on schools reopening is do we benefit the parent body and the learner body that schools work with? Uh, that to me, I think, is is what my strongest argument is. and Quite honestly, I don't know. And I, I don't know just because there's such a diversity in terms of schools, with different learners, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic conditions that they derive from. I think having a standard answer is difficult if you're aware of who your learner population is. And that's kind of where I stand. I'm, I'm on the fence. I'm looking forward to seeing my children again, looking forward to seeing my colleagues again. But that's where I am. Thanks, Anushka, and thanks for also articulating that complexity. You know, I think part of the difficulty of the moment we see ourselves in right now is that a big system which kind of has one answer to particular problems has now to cater for learners who come from very different backgrounds and schools who find themselves with very different challenges. Um, Patricia, I'm going to go to you next if you can share with us what's, what your takes are. Uh, Patricia, if you can just switch on your mic, please. Um, so, hi, guys. Um, 
So I'm sure all of you listened to the address by um, Minister NG on Tuesday. And also she outlined um, the disadvantages of having uh, learners to be outside of school for a long time. And also she did um, quote that she was working with uh, UNICEF and UNESCO uh, with regards to the push of having or making sure that the schools are opened um, um, before it's too late. Um, and I think for me, the most important thing is the safety of the learners and the teachers. And I don't think that um, we are ready to have schools opened on the first. And I have a lot of, um, I, have, I have a few reasons um, to support why I'm saying we are not ready. Um, the first thing is that there are non-negotiables that were out outlined by the basic um, um, education um, people. And one of them is sanitation and water, uh, making sure that there are cleaners and people that are going to screen and additional teaching posts mobile classrooms and uh, incubation camps. And uh, my thing is, I feel like at the end of the day, um, it's quite impossible for our government to be able to, uh, um, to, be able to provide that for us. Uh, for example, our schools have gone for a very long time without water, without proper sanitation. And with schools being rushed to open, a lot of uh, responsibility is going to be placed on our principals and our teachers. And I'm going to quote what um, the MEC of the Western Cape said, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Schaefer, Debbie Schaefer, she said that principals will have to make their own arrangements for cleaning. So they will have to oversee uh, the thorough cleaning. And you find that in public schools, there's only one cleaner. And we probably are going to need a lot of cleaners. And that means that we are going to need money for that. My question is, is our government willing to provide the funds for that? Are there enough funds for public schools to be able to get cleaners, people that are going to make sure that the classes are disinfected, uh, disinfected before the learners get into the classes? And with, with regards to screening, and I heard that uh, teachers will be doing the screenings. And with that, uh, it means that they have to be making sure that they push the curriculum and at the and also that make sure that they do the screenings and with with our cur curriculum, um, I I think it's going to be a quite impossible for teachers to be able to juggle screening and making sure that they are in class. And we have problems in the in the Western Cape. I'm talking about the Western Cape um, transport. It's ridiculous because a lot of learners, for example, I was in Trafal Trafalgar High School, most of them, they come from Kailicha, so they need public transport. Some of them get to school at 11. Some of them get to school at 10. Is, is there going to be a teacher who's going to be standing at the gate, making sure that each and every single uh, learner is screened? And one more thing is with, with what uh, the minister said on Tuesday, she spoke of other people arranging uh, um, classrooms, uh, she was talking about tents, and it's winter. Tents are not going to work for us. And one thing is uh, halls, and that might not be sufficient. For example, there are, she did a quote that there's 1,500 uh, classes that were vandalized, and nothing is being said with regards to that. What's the way forward for schools that were burnt? Uh, and also, the one thing that was very unrealistic is that she said that she wants all the provinces to be on the same pace, which is really, uh, it's really uh, unrealistic, given that uh, they don't have uh, the same resources, you know. And um, one of the thing is, we are going to need people that are trained to disinfect uh, classrooms. Is there going to be enough budget for that? And with with uh, schools opening now on the 25th for, for teachers, do they have masks do they have sanitizers and if they're not there because now principals are also under that impression they have to keep moving if they're not yet uh provided they will have to check in from their own pockets or i don't know which other arrangements they will have to make because they are told that they have to move in the same uh, pace as other provinces which is really unrealistic and um with everyone now back at school now i'm talking about later on in june uh that means that we are going to need extra classrooms. We are going to need uh, new teachers. We're going to need more teachers. And with that, uh, it comes with what's the quality of education Elena's going to get. For example, if 
we are told that uh, the teachers are coming to school together, uh, all of them on the 25th, and they have to teach science. For example, a science class with 60 learners, they have to be divided into three. Are there going to be enough teachers to be able to teach those, um, those learners? And are they qualified to teach science? And, and I feel like with resources like textbooks, um, learners are not supposed to share textbooks or resources because then they will be in contact with each other and they can transmit the, 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 the virus. So now in public high schools, we don't have enough uh, textbooks. You'd find that is 160 learners and there's only 50 textbooks from, from the department. And with, with, with regards to having to give them handouts, maybe you can only uh, print out maybe 60, 60 uh, handouts per day because there isn't enough budget for us to be able to make copies for every single learner. And at the end of the day, we are going to be in short of resources and learners are going to need to have those textbooks and the resources. Are they going to have enough of those uh, when really they need them, when we are back and open? Um, I think that's the whole thing with, uh, I mean, that's my stance on opening now. I think it's too early and I think, if we can tick all the, I mean, the, the checklist, we can tick everything, can tick every single box and say, okay, we've got sanitation, we've got water, we do have cleaners, we do have people that are going to be screening. And with 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 uh, people being unemployed youth, they can do that. They can be paid per hour. Like they come to school from seven o'clock until nine, they do their screenings and they get paid hourly. If if our minister is so concerned with our our learners that if they're out of school they're going to they're going to uh, be raped or they that's going to cause teenage pregnancy if they're really concerned they can they have to put money in that and uh, they have to invest in that and that comes with having to to put money into it. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. I think you're taking us to some of the very practical concerns that come with the implementation of all of these things and also highlighting how some of the inequalities and the challenges we faced uh, even before COVID are now really posing additional challenges when it comes to addressing uh, COVID. Um, Ashley, will you share next what your thoughts are? Thank you, Renee. I think in my view, Reopening schools is not only premature, but it's the wrong solution for the wrong problem. Um, so, so it's a kind of misdiagnosis, if you, if you like. And I think uh, for two reasons, some of which has already been mentioned, I would categorize some of the issues. One, firstly, as the practical problems um, concerning going back to school. And I think those have been well stated in a, in a statement that was written or, or posted by the COVID-19 People's Coalition called We Are Not Ready. And, and in there, I think it documents issues of teacher supply, um, existing problems of overcrowding, school infrastructure, transport, logistics, water and sanitation. And then um, in addition to all of those, the, the threat of the actual virus. Um, so th these practical problems, I mean, just to give an example, earlier this year, we know that several parents weren't able to get their child placed into a school. Um, so it's not as if schools have all this capacity to be able to do splitting of classes, um, or even if we do splitting of classes and platooning systems, it's not as if we have the additional teacher supply readily available. Um, th those are not part of the system as it is. We don't have that capacity available. The, then aside from the, the practical problems, which I think has kind of taken up most of what we've seen in the news at papers and the media, is I would also say there are some critical mistakes which we are making. Um, we need to understand people's position takings and recognize that education is a field in and of itself, but it is also a field which is subordinated to a broader kind of field of power, um, that being the field of politics and economics. And if we begin to use that kind of lens, we can take apart some of the, these reports and articles which have been posted, which frame the issue um, 
as an issue of economics. So if, just by example, I want to consider one recent article that was put forward by an economist and an education columnist um, where the kind of unconscious discourse within that article renders the well-being of the economy uh, as being on par with the well-being of the people. So you hear phrases like, um, it prevents parents and caregivers from getting back to work. It's bad for parents and it's bad for the economy also. Um, this improves parents' mental health and it allows them to go back to work. So when you have those kinds of statements in the mix, um, then you, you have to kind of sit back and say, okay, but are we now talking about sending students back to school because we are talking about the continuity of education or is there something else at stake here? We're wanting to get people back to school um, so that we can actually get the economy going. And if that is the case, then we actually have some serious um, ethical and political um, problems with that kind of position taking. I, I would suggest that an alternative to that is to, instead of accepting that reality, is to problematize the economy. Why in the way that the economy has kind of in media now been anthropomorphized um, in, in such a way that it wants, the economy wants to kill us. <laughs> um, so, but we need to get it back to work. Why, why don't we problematize this economy and ask and take uh, consideration about how we can restructure? If people are going hungry, what do we need to do to, to make sure that people can eat without using the schools as a kind of a, a weak um, response to fixing those kinds of much broader social problems? I think it was one of the, the comments on the Facebook feed um, from Colisa, who says, why can't we feed all families rather than just the children? Can children not be fed in a nearby school and then come home again? And it's exactly that is, it's a kind of, it's a, to, to say students are going hungry, send them to school, it is not the right solution. We need to ask why people are hungry in the first place. What is this economy doing that it's making people hungry? Um, because the point of schooling, I mean, aside from other intents and purposes for which we might use it, is about the business of teaching and learning uh, and not kind of trying to do a quick fix solution um, to these broader social issues. Thanks, Renee. Thanks, Ashley. I think so far all of the speakers have raised points that we definitely need to come back to. But first, going to ask Bebel, Bebel for his initial takes. Uh, good evening, Renee. And um, just to remind you, my surname is Velensky. I'm not related to Monica Lewinsky. Um, Renee, first of all, just to say um, again, good evening to all the, the panelists and to the viewers. Um, please note that the, the comments or the views that I will be sharing this evening is my own views and it's not related to our school. So it's purely my own views. And then just based in terms of the question that you're asking is that um, um, I believe that schools should be open under controlled conditions. Um, and for me, controlled conditions refers to the following. The curve um, should be flattened. All schools should have the basic sanitation and hygiene materials in place for all staff and learners. Thirdly, we have a better understanding and a common understanding as to how the virus works and whether a province, um, in terms of its status as an epicenter, that must be factored into the decision as to whether schools are opened or not. So based on those four facts, um, I'm of the opinion that it would be premature and it would be wrong for us to open schools on the 1st of June. Um, thank you so much, uh, Bevel. You kind of give me a nice segue into the next question, which is around uh, the minister's address and to what extent you, what your guys' impression was of that particular um, address uh, Bevel, you've raised questions around consensus about the evidence or the virus. Um, one also thinks now about consensus about what needs to happen in schools and how it needs to happen and people who actually have to practically implement those plans. I'm particularly interested to hear from you, Anushka and Bevel, to what extent you guys feel that you have received clarity on 
what exactly needs to happen, what your marching orders are, and how that will happen in the next week. Feel free to come in as, as you want to. Okay, Nishka, can you? Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Um, so in terms of clarity being offered, um, I think that uh, the Minister of Education's um, address to, to principals and, and to schools, look, it only happened on, on, on Tuesday. Um, since then, I think we've acquired almost all of the PPE that's promised to us. I told Ashley before we went live that we received the masks for our matrix. We put them up today. We received the hand sanitizer, and I think we got some um, detergents to, to clean around the school as well. But in terms of managing those those vital items that are given to schools, I, I don't. I stand corrected. I, I don't think that yet we have heard any sort of clarity or guidance from it. Um, I do need to go back to what Dr. Mochecha said, though. I believe she said that all schools will receive an orientation program. So I, I'm just going to put it down to, I think it's probably just a work in progress. Uh, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with the idea that the instruction and the utilization of resources and how to control learners at school, and of course, staff to protect you know, well-being and safety. I'm sure that instruction and that guidance will come. But I think at the moment, I personally haven't received any clarity on that yet. Um, Rene, just my, my five cents worth as far as that is concerned. We look, we've, we've received our marching orders. Um, SMTs are supposed to, to familiarize themselves with the guidelines that's presented by DBE as well as by WCD. Um, and then what will happen on Monday is that we need to orientate and train um, the teachers that will be arriving. Um, the challenge, however, um, we all know that in theory, it looks perfect. Um, the practicalities around that, that's where the challenge lies. Um, so, so hopefully, as we go through this process on, on Monday, we will start to understand how it's going to impact our teachers in terms of screening them as they enter the school, and then making sure that we sort of follow the basic rules around um, physical distancing, um, being hygiene orientated, and so on. So, so in my understanding, that's basically the guidelines and the rules of engagement. Um, and then I think the real challenge will happen is when the kids arrive at school and um, just just trying to, to look at what we've done over the past two, three days with um, screening staff as they enter the school, it's, it's quite a, a time consuming process. So I think school starting at eight o'clock, I think that's gonna be a challenge going forward because if you're going to have to do justice to the screening process and the asking of the five questions, I think that's going to be time consuming. So one is gonna to have to be creative, one is gonna to have to think out of the box um, in terms of how do we utilize staff um, and in order to facilitate that particular process. So, so we're quite clear in terms of what the marching orders are. Um, the real challenge will be the implementation of those marching orders as of the 1st of June. Uh, thanks, Bevel. Um, I want to follow up on that contribution that you just made to ask if you can maybe speak a bit more to the practicalities around. We know that, for instance, learners have to social distance, which either requires particular spaces in a school or requires additional teachers. Uh, Patricia also spoke to this issue of now having one maths class or one uh, science class being split into two. Um, can you tell us a bit about the practical complexities of that? How will that play out in schools? Um, maybe give us a reflection in, in your own school context and also in, in, con in school context that might be worse off than your, your school. Um, Renee, we've, we've sort of looked at um, the guidelines provided by DBE and, and WCD, which speaks to the 1,5 sort of distance um, with the, in terms of the space between them. And um, we have about 60 learners in our grade seven um, grade. And um, in order for us to accommodate them, based on the class size, we're looking at potentially having about um, 12 kids per class, which means we're going to need four classes in order to, to safely 
host or um, our grade sixes, I mean, our grade sevens, when they enter on the 1st of June. Um, I think maybe just in terms of the challenges that we face is when our learners arrive at school and some of them arrive at school at about quarter past six in the morning. And, um, but the bulk of them will be arriving between say half past seven and half past eight. I mean, between half past seven and eight o'clock. So managing that influx of kids is going to be a challenge. Like I said, the, the guideline speaks about having one access point. And just in terms of, of the practicality, in terms of implementing that, having one access point at this stage doesn't seem a viable option. So we are potentially looking at the possibility of having two um, gates opened where learners will be able to access. This will obviously need to be communicated to our parents. And um, because we sort of have a little bit of a luxury of having teacher assistance at our school and also the fact that our grade sevens will be the target in terms of the phased in approach, we would be able to make use of our additional teachers to man the gate and to do the necessary screening. Um, with that being said, um, the real challenge will be when it's winter and it's storming and kids need to enter the school premises, coupled with the fact that you have staff that will be arriving at the same time and having to screen them and having to manage or juggle both balls at the same time. So, so I think going forward, especially in lieu of the fact that it will be winter, that's going to pose a challenge to us. Um, and we'll just have to try and see how we're going to work around that. Um, thanks, Bevel. That's, uh, I mean, imagining 12 learners per classroom. I can imagine that that's still possible when you've got one grade uh, coming to school, but it does raise serious questions about what happens once more learners come back or in schools where the classes are even bigger. Like to hear if there are any other volunteers on the panel who'd like to share a perspective on that. Uh, Anushka? Uh, thanks, guys. I promise I won't dominate too much. Um, thank you, firstly, Bevel, for the clarity regarding the DVE protocols. I think something that's pretty interesting is that I, again, I work at a high school. We've got almost 700 children. We've got a matric class this year of about 100. Um, and a lot of what happens in schools is people tend to become more comfortable in teaching certain grades. So something we've tried to adopt at our school, and we are certainly in a more privileged position than both, is we're looking at how can we use subject departments to be able to teach uh, the grade 12s because they're the first grade that's returning to our school. Um, and we're looking at that just in trying to limit how many learners we have in a class. So at the moment going forward, um, and it's a letter we're actually gonna send out to our parents tomorrow about this. The maximum number of learners we will have per class at Swans Lake High School come June the 1st for the grade 12s is going to be 20. That's our golden number, that's our cutoff date. Uh, usually our classes are about 25, 27 for the matrics. Um, they're our smallest grade at the school, as, as usually happens in high schools. But I think what's incredibly important to keep in mind is, you know, at schools where perhaps you haven't got staff who are as comfortable teaching the grade, perhaps they aren't specialized for, how does that determine and impact the quality of teaching and learning um, that the learners are going to get when they've been told to come back to school come June the 1st? Uh, I, I recognize again, grade seven and grade 12 are incredibly important years in children's lives. Uh, they're both, of course, exit years as well. So we're looking at how do they use the end of the year results to be able to get them into bigger and better things for the next year, hopefully, um, if we have teachers who are being asked to teach uh, grades or subjects that perhaps they aren't necessarily comfortable doing, how do we ensure quality teaching and quality learning for every child in every province and every school? Uh, thanks, Anushka. I'm being told that there's a lively discussion happening in the Facebook comments. So I'm going to ask Kyan if he can please uh, put up some of the questions on the screen for our panelists. And you guys can feel free to volunteer answers as you feel comfortable. The first one is from Sarah Black. She says, how are schools identifying which teachers are available for contract service? So talking about um, additional teachers who will be brought in, either supply teachers or the minister this morning spoke about newly qualified teachers. Um, how is that process going to, or how is that process working?
Any takers from the panel? Can they can I maybe attempt? Yes. Look, let, let me firstly start by saying that um, we all know, we're all aware of the, the Funza Lushaka bursary orders. And um, the department on a regular basis will send us um, a list of, of students that are available for, for placing. Um, the disappointing part about that list is that when a person contacts the individuals on the list, they either have a job or they've been placed or they're just not interested at all. So I, I'm, I'm quite curious to know how we're going to find these additional teachers. Um, I think if, if we look at, um, at the phasing in starting, in starting with grade seven, then I think you would be able to potentially tap into your grade six and your grade five teachers to assist in terms of teaching the grade sevens as such. Um, but having teachers readily available in terms of the database that's provided by um, the department through the Funza Lushaka bursary orders, I think based on my experience, that's been basically um, a, a futile exercise in order to access teachers from that particular list. So I don't see that as an option. Um, they might have to tap into retired teachers. Um, the challenge there would be that um, recently the department or WCD indicated that they will no longer employ retired teachers. So I'm, I'm hoping that they will change their policy in order to accommodate those teachers going forward. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Revel. I think that also poses a question for Patricia, who, Patricia, you are a newly qualified teacher. Um, whether there's been any communication with newly qualified teachers, if you know whether teachers are ready. And I guess also um, how prepared are newly qualified teachers to enter a system we know that South Africa is notoriously bad at providing the kinds of support that new teachers need in the classroom. This is now a high pressure situation. And these teachers might be, as Anushka highlighted, having to teach grades that they've never taught before. I know it's kind of a training to just teach grade eight and nine first before you hit the big classes. So can you give us a, a bit of a perspective on that? All right. So um, I'm also a Funza Lushaka um, recipient, bursary recipient. So we had a group uh, on, on WhatsApp for all the recipients of Funza that were not yet employed. And it's quite a number of us that have not been employed yet. And we're having like discussions with, with um, uh, our lecturers from UCT because we really wanted to get jobs because with uh, the WCE saying that they were not going to provide additional posts, it was really hard for us because obviously as a holder of Funza Lushaka, I can't apply for a pri uh, private school to get a job. I have to apply uh, in a public school because that's my service. Um, so we really struggled to have a lot of people. We have a group on WhatsApp for uh, Funza Lushaka. We have not been... Um, employed and we really went for discussions with people from the union also and there hasn't been any way forward because we still are unemployed. Um, with regards to uh, jumping into teaching a grade 12, um, when we have not even started teaching um, grade eight or grade nine, because with, 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 with the teaching practice, you don't have a, a enough time to actually be very confident in teaching grade 12. Um, and with that, given that grade 12, they're going to cover everything in the curriculum, it will be a bit challenging. But as a person who is unemployed now, I will jump into it and give it my best because I really do need a job. Uh, and I think a lot of, um, of my, my peers that are, are unemployed, they also are willing to take that chance and say, hey, I know I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not I'm not confident that I can teach grade 12, but I've been unemployed and it's May now. So I just have to take that chance and give it my best shot. Yeah, that's that's and, and under the current circumstances, Patricia, what do you think are some of the types of support that the newly qualified teacher going into a school that they don't know, teaching a subject that maybe they've taught in prac but haven't taught in, in school? Mm -hmm. What are the types of support that, that teacher would need? 
I think uh, because when you're doing your PGCA, your PGCE, you are not really taught on how to do your admin. And I think a lot of support can um, other teachers that are qualified and have been teaching for a long time, teaching us and like showing us how to do our admin and really showing us how to do a lot of things that um, that have got to do with, with admin. I think that's the one thing, really having someone to mentor you with regards to admin and yeah, that's about it. Great, thanks. I'm gonna ask Ashley if there are other questions coming in from the uh, from our social media pages that can be put to the public. Uh, Salome Scott is saying they want our kids to go to school in a phased and controlled process. What does that mean? What does that mean for underprivileged children in underprivileged communities? What does it mean to a kid who is six years old? We are battling as parents to explain to our kids the enormity of the situation and how it, uh, it has affected our communities and the work. How on earth are the teachers going to control this? I'm back at work and for me, it's difficult operating in this new environment. Uh, so Salome really uh, asking some very difficult questions there, also about the uh, psychological effect of going back to school, adapting to a new reality after people have been at home for so long, uh, the stress of trying to control that environment, um, and especially also how this is likely to affect people along class lines in different uh, ways. I don't know if there's any perspective from the panel on, on that input. Uh, Ashley, Renee, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to respond to this question as well as to the question which uh, Clements uh, put on the feed uh, concerning preconditions. And I think this issue of uh, working class schools or schools for the poor is quite a central thing to consider because if you think about our education system and all its schools, this is you're actually talking about the majority of schools that are for the working class and the poor. Um, my work takes me into schools like these. Um, not even the worst of, because um, I'm sitting here in Cape Town in an urban space, um, but I can tell you that when you walk into some of these schools, things like ablution facilities, toilets, um, at one school, for example, the boys' toilets, there's maybe one working stall. Um, the rest of them are non-existent. There aren't any taps uh, so that people can wash their hands. And then the school is placed in a predicament whereby it now needs to decide with its uh, budget allocation that it has, is it going to decide to repair the school toilets or is it going to employ uh, an SGB educator for another month? So those kind of predicaments in which working class schools are placed also position them in ways that they are far from ready to be able to um, now go back to school in the context of a global pandemic. Uh, I mean, they weren't ready prior to this. Um, schools, the, those toilets were un unhygienic spaces for students to, and, and teachers, by the way, to access prior to this. Now we are just saying, okay, let's go back to those same toilets, um, those same classrooms where maybe even the structural integrity of the building um, is an issue. We don't know when, how long the roof will last, or we, we don't know whether the roof is built from asbestos. And some of those schools are built from as best as roofs, which are which are, are crumbling. So already we were we were happy to send teachers and students to schools like that. Now we were saying you must go back to those same schools, but with the added threat of okay, you might now experience loss of life through a, a virus which is busy spreading. So I think those are real concerns which people have. And if I may, uh, part of my work that I do with with high school students is doing critical sociology. And one really lovely quote um, from someone I like is a French sociologist called Boudier, and says that any political program that fails to take full advantage of the possibilities for action, minimal though they may be, that science can help uncover, can be considered guilty of non-assistance to a person in danger. And so my questions maybe to Minister Angie Mocheka in, in, taking these questions into consideration is, have the Department of Education taken advantage, full advantage of the range of possibilities of action which they have 
to do in this moment in time? And I would say the answer to that is no. During this time which schools have been closed, so much could now be done or this time could be utilized to start fixing those toilets, um, building the additional classroom space, ensuring that the additional teacher supply is in place. But it, it doesn't seem that that has been on the agenda of the department, kind of the, this logic of by hook or by crook um, and the reopening the economy at all costs and now sending students back to school at, at any cost um, seems to be what's dominating or, or what seems to persevere. Thanks, Renee. Uh, thanks, Ashley. Those are important perspectives and I definitely want to at the end come back to the question around the possibilities. You have highlighted tremendous challenges in the education system that we know the department's been trying to fix for years and hasn't been fixed. I guess it raises the question whether it's possible in the foreseeable future to address all of those issues that, uh, that you've highlighted. And does that then mean that we don't go back to school until that's addressed, even if that takes another year, another eight months, or in our experience, another couple of years. That's can I, can, oh, can, I, can, I, can I comment? Look, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Ashley said, and I think maybe this gives us an opportunity to press the reset button and, and see in terms of what we need to do to improve um, what's wrong in our system. And as Ashley mentioned, the fact that um, the some of the structures of our schools are just non-existent or there's issues or challenges that we face in that regard. And, and therefore, I'm saying, given the fact that the conditions haven't been met yet, um, we should keep our schools closed and really look at opening our schools um, in term four. And the reason for that is it gives us time to really look at our teachers what it is that we need to do to recapacitate our teachers from a skills perspective and maybe just in terms of their own teaching pedagogy um, and then looking at the infrastructure of our schools and fixing all those things and and while those things are busy happening we need to access or look at how do we ensure that online learning becomes a norm within our society to make sure that all our kids have access to free data so so this time being under lockdown gives the gives the, the the Department of Education, both national and provincial, the opportunity to fix what is wrong. And um, therefore, like I said, I agree with Ashley, and therefore it gives us this time now to fix all the things that we need to fix. And um, but also making sure that we are mindful that there is a big possibility that schools must open, but the timing as of the first of June is just not ideal. And then maybe just to go back to the, the one person who asked about the phased in process. Um, if I look at potentially at our school, just listening to the question, I would, I would possibly would like to see that we have all our grades returned at the same time. And that means from grade R to grade seven. And again, I'm emphasizing this should happen in term four. Um, and having all grades come in at the same time we could potentially look at halving our classes. In our case, we have 30 learners in the class. So we could have on, on a Monday from grade R to seven, we could have 15 learners in a class and the next day, the other half would be accommodated as such. And the reason for that is, um, like Ashley indicated, we serve the working class and our parents need to work. So you, you can't have grade sevens come to school, parents are working, so what happens to the siblings? So in terms of my thinking at the moment, if we have grade R's up to sevens coming in, half of them on a Monday and the other half coming in on the Tuesday over a 10 day cycle, you could cater and accommodate siblings that could be in grade seven and some being in grade one, and you could sort of place them or allocate them based on the fact that they are siblings. And in that way, you would also make sure that parents can go and work and the kids, all the kids are sort of accommodated at school at a particular given point in time. 
But you must remember I'm speaking from a primary school perspective and it's, it's much more easier. And given our small numbers that we have as a school, um, that's potentially the way that I see it should happen um, when the time is right for us to open. Thank you. Thanks, Bevel. Your comment about only coming back in the fourth term raises the question that's kind of been swirling around and Ashley also mentioned it at some point, which is uh, the saving the, the 2020 school year at all costs. And I'd like to put that question to the panel. Should we be anxious about saving the 2020 school year, number one? Number two, is it still possible to save the 2020 school year if we think about some of the things we've already talked about, the psychosocial uh, effects of this period, the fact that when there's an outbreak in a school, the minister today on radio said a school will be closed down, so potentially you'll have more disruptions to school time, the challenges around teachers with comorbidities not coming to school. And then we haven't even touched on whether learners will actually pitch up on, at school when schools reopen. So how should we be thinking about this question of saving the 2020 academic year? Anushka, you look ready to come in. Look, you're, you're saying and you're asking such incredibly important questions, Mai. Um, I think you know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one. Can we save the 2020 academic year for, for the children across the country? Ooh, what, what happens if we don't, you know? I mean, what happens to things like, like school fees? Again, I, I, I work with this, I speak about it a lot. But what happens if the 2020 academic year is not uh, able to start this year? What then happens to schools who rely on a monthly basis on school fee intake? If we consider how difficult it is for a lot of people in this time, then you know, being unable to work and, and, and those kinds of things. How can we encourage school fee payment if people haven't even got money to feed their own children, to feed their own families, to get to and from work? If schools don't reopen, will we not have some sort of across the board blanket shutting down of schools who are unable to, to afford to continue? And I think that's what I, I kind of started speaking of when you asked me to open the conversation this evening. You know, the idea that schools need to open because schools need to be able to, in inverted commas, earn the school fees that they're asking of, 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 of parents to be able to provide the service to, to children. If we don't do that, I am worried that we're going to wind up having a mass shutdown of schools. We're going to have teachers who haven't got, uh, or staff members who not have any income or any salary. What happens then? So I understand why we need to open. I, I don't know how I feel about Mr. Valensky's comment about schools opening possibly in the fourth term. Um, I think if we open in the fourth term, grade 12 exams start a week after that. Um, you know, if we open too soon, as Ashley was speaking about, we, we run the risk of, of, of learners and, and staff taking ill. I, I don't know what the best way forward is. Like I said at the beginning, I, I'm on the fence still. Um, but I, I, I still stand behind what I, I've chosen to do as a profession. I, I recognize that teachers are so much more than just teaching the curricula. Uh, I, I saw the, the concern in the comment that I think was posed by, I think her name was Salome. I hope I'm saying that correctly. You can just hear the concern in parents' voices about their children. Um, and I think that's a, it's a shared response to schools. But I also think that we need to go back to what role schools play in societies. And that's something I ascribe to very, very fondly. The idea that you need to serve the learners and the parents that you that form part of your community. If you hear parents who are saying, I'm really uncomfortable, I'm really scared about what's going to happen to my child, engage with them. Try to hear what their concerns are and, hear, and let their concerns shape how your school implements um, the strategies being imposed to allow us to open on the 1st of June for certain grades. Thanks, Anushka. Ashley, I know you um, you earlier articulated a bit of a different view. I think maybe just to speak to Anushka's point, and I think when I said uh, we need to uh, contest how the problem is being framed and, and, and that it's a misdiagnosis, I think it speaks directly to Anushka's point is that if we reframe the problem as a problem 
uh, as a crisis of capitalism rather, uh, in which public institutions have been stripped almost bare through privatization, austerity and marketization, then we have better ways of coming up with solutions. So, so, so on one hand, if you take, for example, a hospital, um, some of these kind of projection models which people are working with now are saying that we are not going to have enough ICU beds or they're going to be at capacity. Um, and, and this is because investments haven't been made within the public sector to create that and build that capacity. So now we kind of left ill-equipped um, when there's a pandemic. And I think the same way that that's true in the health sector is the same way it's now true in education as well, is that uh, schools are having to rely on using school fees to employ additional staff. That What does that tell us? That tells us that there's actually not enough teachers, so much so that parents are now having to supplement what the government is supplying to the school in order to get enough to be able to run school. And unfortunately, because of the kind of uh, history of racialized capitalism in South Africa, as well as our kind of the, the layout of spatial apartheid, it positions some schools in such a way that even if it wanted to draw on fees from the community, it would be impossible for the school to do that. One school that I work at, for example, um, lives in a neighborhood called Parkwood. Now, uh, the Parkwood School, for example, could uh, today decide as an SGB, we want to charge, like the other schools, 3,000 Rand a month. Uh, that wouldn't translate into Parkwood because some parents, for example, don't even earn 3,000 Rand for the month um, and would never be able to commit that to, to a monthly school fee. So, th so the issue is not so much just like the collection of school fees, which is so vital to, to schools, but we need to go one step deeper and say, but if this is the problem, then government needs to be supplying enough resources to schools. And in part, and maybe not, we don't want to position people as resources, but they also need to provide enough so that schools can have the staff that they need, as opposed to having to rely on additional inputs into that system. Thanks, Renee. Thanks, Ashley. I think you raise a really important point about how we are kind of facing the consequences of underinvestment in social services now. We are really seeing the consequences of that, whether that's in terms of school infrastructure or teacher supply to schools. Schools have really had to stretch their budgets and even schools that rely on um, parent contributions are, are struggling. Um, it does raise, it does speak to the question you posed earlier around, I guess, a broader broken system and schools being expected to solve all of these uh, uh, problems. What we are, in addition to the question around the academic year, another concern that's being raised is the ability of this broader system to look after kids if they are not at school. Um, and you mentioned at the beginning that um, you know, we should look at fixing that broader system rather than expecting schools to, to address all those things. My question to the panel is, how do we think about that very daunting task in the immediate, where we know that the Department of Social Development has, been, has failed dismally at providing food to families, um, to providing food to learners, the school nutrition program hasn't reopened, uh, psychosocial services in communities aren't reaching the people uh, it needs to reach. How do we think about what is possible in the in the immediate? Are there any any takers for that question? Can I, can I just yeah. I, I just want to go back to the saving the academic year and please I, I'm not. I'm not a fan of saving the academic year, okay? But let me give you some, some context in terms of what it is that I'm saying amidst the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So, so what I'm saying is the following. I'm saying let's assess the, the physiological and safety needs of all our kids, and, and that includes our teachers as well. Let's, let's assess what's happening from that perspective, okay? And then as a collective, including the various stakeholders, um, Let's, let's engage 
each and let's try and devise a plan. Okay, and, and part of the plan that I'm suggesting is let's progress all the learners from grade R to grade 11 because you have at the moment we have a process of admissions for 2021. So you have kids that need to come into the system. So I'm suggesting it, let's progress all the learners from grade R to 11. And then the grade 12s, I would use the suggestions that, that's been forwarded by Professor Jensen. I think he speaks quite eloquently in terms of that particular suggestion, and I'm in support of that. I think we need to, to really look at the grade 12 end of the year exam. There's enough time to, to draw up a new exam. Um, and then I would also like to see that our, our curriculum advisors and our teachers, that they come together, they look at what are the key skills and knowledge and values that's needed with COVID-19 as the overarching theme, and how do we sort of redesign a new curriculum for the next 14 months and if i'm speaking about term four which will include the next 12 months as well of the following year um, in order to equip our kids with the necessary skills values and knowledge that will capacitate them to at least have a fighting chance given the year that we we confronted with at the moment and then like i said we need to make sure that we provide data to all our households um, and those people that can afford the data maybe they could get a reduced price. Um, and then also, like I said previously, it's about enhancing our capability and our skills of our teachers, you know? So how do we capacitate the ICT skills so that we can ensure that, that remote learning and online learning becomes the order of the day and also making sure that the haves, the gap between the haves and the have-nots, um, that that gap is completely diminished as such. And then, once we've reached them, we can again reassess in terms of um, do we open in term four? But I would suggest that that those solutions that I've mentioned, it's not about um, saving the year, but coming up with a plan in order to deal with grade R's to 11, and then also dealing with grade 12's going forward. And, and like I said, based on the last question that you asked, Rene, it's about um, assessing what's the physiological needs of our kids across the board and then getting social development with WCD or National Department of Education, their social workers and psychologists to go out into the field and to go and provide the service to our, to our communities and also um, Department of Social Development for them to, to up the game as far as um, addressing the basic needs of our communities in making sure that they are fed so that we can ensure that our kids do not go to school now because it's not the right time for them to go to school and, and ensure that their basic needs are met as such. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Bevel. You are all giving us so many more things to talk about. We could have a separate panel on each of these uh, points. But I do want to make sure that we also get to um, the comments on social media. So, Kyan, if you can pull up some questions for us there, that would be great. Um, Thomas Salman is saying, has anyone canvassed parents in the local community? I know that my friends teaching in the UK said 80% of their parents said they would refuse to send their kids into school right now. I'm really glad that question is be being raised because I think it raises this que question around consensus. Uh, and like part of reopening schools is building the consensus around all the stakeholders who need to return to schools that that's a good idea. Um, I don't know, Patricia, if you want to come in on that thought around teachers, parents, learners, all those people who need to go back to school and uh, whether when on 1st June we're actually going to see people in schools. So with, with, with reopening of schools, uh, it's a step forward for the economy to be opened. And I think that's where the rush is. And concerns that comes with uh, parents not being sure if the safety of their kids is, is, is going to, to be met. And... Um, my concern also is that our teachers, you know, their safety, is it really going to be considered? And with that comes um, us having to speak to, to, to people in our communities and actually having to, to try and stop uh, 
this from going forward because I personally feel like we are not ready. But the the other thing also is with the speech that we had on Tuesday, um, there actually are limited options. Uh, for example, with 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 learners that the the parents are not they're not educated, so they can't they can't afford to to homeschool them, and also with with that comes. Next year, their 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 sport in school it's not it's not guaranteed because they will have to apply again, and now people have the only option now it's like people are forced to go back to school, learners are forced back to school, and parents probably don't feel like they have a say in it because now it's either homeschooling or having to repeat and applying from uh, from from scratch the following for the following year. So I think it would be good if we speak up as the community, especially people that are not happy with uh, schools being open prematurely, and that's going to be very hazard hazardous for for the health of teachers and and learners. So I think it's something that we really have to look into because I know a lot of people um, they sh they share the same sentiments as me, but also with other people that really want to go back to school and they need their kids to be back in school. So it's obviously a bit um, uh, confusing, obviously, because a lot of people share different sentiments, but most, they wouldn't want to send their school, their learners to school with with no guarantee that their safety will come first. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. You're highlighting the difficult choices parents are facing and the fact that some parents might feel under these circumstances that they don't really have a choice. Anushka, I know you work quite closely with SGBs, and the SGB associations on television have been quite concerned about the department mm. getting ready for one June. What is your sense about the consensus among parents about sending their kids back to school? Uh, thanks. So I am, am largely at the forefront of, of communicating from my school's governing body to the learner body and to the parents that, um, that we work with. There have been a couple of parents that come that come back to us and have said, I'm not comfortable. I uh, am feeling very uncomfortable with sending my child back to school. We aren't happy with the measures that have been impl implemented. We aren't happy with the PPE being provided. Um, but at least in my experience um, at, at, at my school, the majority of the parents seem to be in favor of their child coming back. But I also think that possibly speaks to them needing their child to move on to the next phase of their of their lives. I think that high schools and primary schools um, have very different sort of needs that we need to fulfill. I think in a high school, one of the fundamental jobs that we have is to get them into our high school and out in four or five years to make certain that they're going on to do more. So I'm not entirely certain because we haven't had enough access or as much access as I'd like to the parent body that I that I work with. I'm not certain to what extent they are supportive of, of schools reopening because they want their child to move on to better and, and bigger things next year, or if there's some other factor that will that's probably shaping that. I think this will this will come when I when I see them again. And they know the school's officially open for next week. So I'm hoping then we'll get more input from the community that we work with. Thanks, Anushka. Those challenges of communicating during this time to build that type of consensus and get thoughts. Ashley, mm -hmm. you work closely with mm -hmm. learners. Oh, sorry, Bevel, you want to come yeah. in? Go. Renee, just, just on the question in terms of consultation. You know, I'm a union member and um, our union um, released a joint statement with some other unions some time ago. And, and one of the headings um, says, in particular, as far as my union is concerned, was that um, they, they've, they've gotten in, input from principals. Now, I've never been consulted as a principal as being part of this particular union to give my opinion based on um, negotiations with DBE or discussions with them. So, so the question I firstly want to ask is, um, where did the unions, or my union in particular, where did they get their mandate from? to have negotiations or discussions with DBE? That's the first question. And then if I look at our governing body associations, who predominantly represents SGBs, um, with parents being the dominant um, constituent represented on those SGBs, 
how many of those governing body associations actually speak on behalf of the parents? And I actually have a major concern about that because um, the way I see our, our democratic South Africa work is that it's almost like a, it's a bottom-up approach. And if I, if I embrace the bottom-up approach, then I, I'm asking the question, where have these people consulted and who have they consulted and, and on whose behalf are they speaking? So, so I get the feeling when I listen to the to Minister Mochecha when she speaks based on the, the briefing she had on the 30th of April and the one that she had on the 19th of May, it's almost like she's mocking the fact that she has consulted with them and now she's making these statements and it's almost like they, um, they're diving for cover. So I still need to know who was consulted and why was it that I was not consulted in terms of the discussions that took place as far as my union is concerned. And then the other point I want to make is, as a school, we have surveyed our grade seven parents with the fact that um, there's a possibility that school will open on the 1st of June. And um, of the 48 parents that we surveyed, 41% indicated that they will send their children back to school, but there were some reservations. And 59% um, of them said that they will not be sending their kids back to school. But I think, I think in essence, what I'm asking for is that we need to go back to grassroots level and we need to go and start those conversations where we consult with our parents, with our teachers and with our learners, you know, and then collectively we decide how do we move forward. And I really think there's a massive, massive need for that to happen because at the moment it's as if the people in high places they are the ones who are making the decisions and they are disregarding the people on the ground who is affected the worst or the or the most as far as what is happening. Um, I think we need to go back to that particular place where we were. Thank you, Bevel. Ashley, in two sentences, because there are a couple more questions we want to get to. You work with learners. What's your sense of, of learners' fears and thoughts? I I think what students are saying, or at least those whom we have access to, is legitimate and realistic concerns that I think any high school student might have. I mean, and these include, when am I going to be able to finish grade 12? Um, I was hoping to apply or to do something more after this. Um, concerns about teachers who are sending homework during lockdown. Um, and students who don't have cell phones or computers to be able to do the homework or any materials at home that can support that. Um, we have uh, students who come from immigrant families and their parents are unable to easily access things like UIF. Um, and so there's food insecurity at home, um, electricity and gas supply, all of these stuff of stuff that students have mentioned to us. Um, we are only able now to communicate via WhatsApp groups and, I don't know, trying to do video calls online with those who are able to. Um, there are several students, for example, who don't have access to any of those things. But these are some of the, the thoughts which have come through. I think in the same way that um, Bevel was saying, uh, parents um, and maybe even teachers haven't really been consulted in any real way, I would say those who have the most stake in the game, um, the students themselves, I doubt whether anyone is actually consulted with what students have to say. Thanks, Ashley. And all the buy-in from all those stakeholders in the end is critical to making sure that when schools open on 1 June, there's actually teachers and learners in, in school. Um, Kayan, there's some more questions coming in. Polisa says, how, easily, how easy will it be to teach with a mask on? This raises some practical questions about PPE, I guess, also whether you can imagine learners keeping a mask on for an entire day. Anyone want to share a thought on that? Anushka? Sure. Uh, I saw nobody was <laughs> going to answer, so here I am. I see Ashley's leading from the front there. Um, I think that mask usage is, and teaching with a mask, and, and you know, presenting with a mask on, it's something that I've had to adopt. Um, and we've been doing it now for about a week and a bit. Um, and it's it's typical because you're very much aware of it, but I'm hoping that with practice, it becomes easier. 
I also think that with a smaller number of learners per class to Koliswa, who had the question with them, less numbers of learners per class, it does mean that having to project your voice is going to be far easier to do because you won't necessarily have to because you have you know, a handful of kids in front of you compared to what you usually have. So I think that with that response, it balances out each other. I think that mask usage and teaching with the mask on is made easier because you're hopefully going to have smaller classroom sizes. But um, no, it's not. It's not pleasant. It's, um, it's difficult. A lot of children and a lot of adults struggle with breathing as well. But it is something that I recognize we have to do. And so I think you kind of just try to make the most of it. And also, from what I'm hearing from my colleagues and, you know, people I see in the shops and so on, I, I don't know if it is as difficult to hear what people are saying um, as, you know, if you're not wearing a mask. A concern I do have, though, is that the masks that I think I'm seeing being provided by DBE, um, a lot of them are not going to be able to, to assist people who are hard of hearing. Uh, those who need to lip read, if the mouth is covered entirely, how do we assist those learners and those staff members to be able to deliver curriculum or to engage with questions? So I think there are pros and cons to it. Um, but I think for the most part, the articulation and, and hearing, if you are able to do so, it's not that much different with the mask on. Uh, thanks, Anushka. I just want to apologize that uh, Patricia has unfortunately dropped off the call and is unable to come back, but thanks for her contribution. Um, and we'll almost be wrapping up ourselves. I think there's one final question and then we'll go to the panelists for closing comments. Uh, Gillian Williams says, my concern is for the children who arrive by taxi. Will the taxi drivers adhere to the 70% rule? Who will be responsible? Ball for monitoring this. Will the traffic department assist schools? Thoughts on that? Uh, Bevel, do you have learners traveling to your school with public transport? Yeah, um, Renee, we, we regard it as a commuter school. Um, so we have quite a few, in fact, the vast majority of our kids that travel um, using public transport and um, those using. Um, scholar transport as well. So yes, it's going to be a challenge. And um, again, that's what, again, that's why I'm saying, let's delay the start of school so that we have a better understanding as to what is happening. Um, and so that we can make sure that there's big, um, better checks and balances in place. Um, so, and, and, and again, our, our history in terms of um, um, scholar transport in particular is that um, some of the, the, um, the service providers, they are low unto themselves. You know, you would have noticed that there's been an increase of, of some taxis that have tinted their windows where you can't even see in at all. So you can just imagine what's going to be happening there. And again, if, if one looks at the history prior to, to the pandemic, then um, because parents are so desperate to get their children to school, they almost allow anything to happen as far as the children um, being traveled or transported to school as such. So it poses a major challenge. And um, I think the authorities in terms of um, the traffic department, the police, the army, and I think the army should be deployed in order to make sure that they make up for, for losing some faith, um, face in terms of the way that they've conducted themselves. So maybe we could have them um, placed strategically just to monitor ensure and ensure that the rules are adhered to. Um, but I think you, you asked previously about the masks and teaching. I think we're going to be in for some fun and games. So we're looking forward to that experience coming up, um, Renee. Uh, thanks, Bevel. I won't take us into a conversation now around the deployment of the army around schools, but that's a whole debate for another um, day. But I think also important to keep in mind that the scholar transport challenges in province, in more rural provinces are even more severe and there isn't enough uh, supply as is. So who knows what's going to happen with a 70% capacity rule. Um, we want to close off in the next 10 minutes. So I'm going to now bring us back to the question Ashley posed earlier around this moment actually presenting some opportunities. Bevel, I think you also touched on that 
presenting an opportunity to do, to reimagine or to put in place certain things that we've struggled with. What do you think is practically can come out of this time, can be implemented under the constraints that we currently have that will have positive outcomes for education in years to come? Um, Anushka, if we can maybe start with you. Uh, sure. I think that one of the biggest issues I, I think need, that need to come out of this current um, global crisis we find ourselves in is I think what, what Bevel spoke about, what Ashley spoke about, certainly what Patricia when she was present spoke about as well. And it is really this notion of redistributing resources. I believe Bevel's words were um, bridging the gap, diminishing that gap between schools that have and schools that don't have, between homes that have and homes that don't have as well. I think that income distribution and a distribution of, of wealth across all structures in our society is something that should have happened a hell of a long time ago. I think it is highlighted now that there are schools that are feeling more equipped to start or to open on June 1st compared to other schools that are feeling far less equipped to open um, because Ashley spoke about how you know, school fees, if they're coming in, are now being used to supplement PPE and to supplement teachers and to supplement things that should have been made available to begin with. There have been a couple of conversations um, about schools needing to open to allow learners to access, you know, food and the feeding schemes again. There should never have been, to begin with, a child, an adult, an aged person, any person, they should never begin with be anybody who doesn't have access to those kinds of things. I think that one of the biggest approaches all schools need to adopt as we as we work toward opening officially for our children on the 1st of June is the idea of sharing resources amongst and between each other. If you are looking at a school where you have, let's say, 170 grade, grade sevens, for example, can that school not maybe distribute some of their learners to a school where there are less um, learners just to be able to accommodate uh, people's teaching and people's learning and people's health as well. I think that partnerships need to form very quickly. And I think only in forming partnerships as opposed to schools working, in my opinion, very largely in isolation from each other. I think that partnership forming is going to be able to benefit children. It's going to improve pedagogy of teachers. You're going to be possibly from a school that maybe is less resourced, uh, working with the school where there are more resources, your teachers will get better, your learners will be exposed to a different kind of culture and way of doing things. And I think that is something I, I, I need to see moving forward in order for everybody to be able to access what clearly, given how popular this, this fish tank is, what is clearly such a fundamental, important human right. Um, Ashley or Bevel? Maybe, yeah, maybe in closing, I think there's so much that is possible. Um, and I don't think any of it is really new. Um, for me, for teachers to be practicing critical praxis, um, where they assist students not just to kind of deliver the curriculum or implement the curriculum, but to help students engage in ideology critique, in critical self-reflection, and to be able to use that knowledge in the environments where the school is situated and in their communities to be actually to able to change the world. Um, one person, one of our local activists put it this way is, uh, we don't just accept reality for what it is, we change reality. Uh, that was Marcus Solomon. And I think that we can have an education system where students and teachers are engaging in this kind of critical praxis. It's nothing, it's not a new idea but we need to ask the questions of what's been preventing that. And if we just attend to these structural problems, these inequalities, these lack of infrastructure, these undersupply of teachers, then we can do this so that we don't have to, for example, witness like, like I did going into not, not just one, but several classrooms where you arrive in the, in the room and somebody is busy writing on the board from the textbook and students are copying this into their notes. Now, I don't think that is because the teacher lacks the ability or that they lack the knowledge and the understanding to engage in critical pedagogies. I think it's because they're placed into a situation where they are grossly under-resourced, 
they are pressured having to complete assessment tasks and other kind of administrative duties which teachers have to do that puts them into a space where actually we can't engage coupled with that is students who haven't eaten students who are living in communities where there's violence um, all of the kinds of uh, stuff which are the result of how we've structured our social world so yeah i think lots is possible um, but i hope that we have the willpower to actually do something about it thanks ashley bevel okay um Renee, i just want to just latch on to what what ashley said and um Look, as much as what I agree with Ashley's last comments that he made in terms of teachers and the constraints they 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 sort of find themselves within, I, I also believe that that some of our teachers um, don't have the ability to sort of think for themselves and to think creatively as well. And I sometimes I put it down to the fact that if one looks at pre ninety four, if one looks at the type of education system we had it didn't allow much for, for critical thinking. So, so I think the challenge we faced before this pandemic is the fact that some of our teachers um, stick religiously to the textbook and um, don't allow themselves to interpret what it is that they need to teach and then convey that by using different vehicles and not just accessing the textbook or the CAPS curriculum itself. So, so I, I think sometimes some teachers are not innocent I think they just allow themselves to, to be forced in a particular direction and do what is prescribed of them. And I think we need to, to sort of, we have the opportunity now to change that. But I just wanted to comment based on what Ashley commented in terms of his last remarks. But in terms of me re reimagining schools, this is what I would like to, to focus on. The first thing I would like to do is, is to convene a meeting of all the relevant stakeholders and then look at how do we prepare for the for 21st century learning and teaching itself? And here the emphasis should be on the four C's, which is critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication. How do we make that the focal point of our new curriculum that I think we should be designing? And I would like to see it being a process of having all stakeholders engaged in that particular process. I'm not going to elaborate too much on that because um, I think there are people out in the field that will be able to come up with amazing ideas in order to, to redesign a new curriculum for us. And then the second point is, I would like to see that we repurpose um, all district um, office staff and utilize them within our schools where there's the greatest need. Um, Ashley spoke earlier about there's a shortage of teachers. They are excellent curriculum advisors that can be successfully integrated into our school system and they can alleviate um, the, the demands in terms of the shortage of teachers as such. Um, I would like to see that our principals are excluded from our staff establishments so that principals are not um, um, asked to teach per se, but they can occasionally do sort of master class lessons as such, but they should be completely removed from the staff establishments. And then I think an urgent thing we also need to look at is really looking at the quintile system and making sure that we either get rid of that system completely, but the quintile system is a, is a joke at the moment. And I also think that where there's been a massive influx in terms of learners, especially in Gauteng and the Western Cape, that your national treasury should make sure that that money escorts those kids when they, when they come into different provinces as such. And then I would like to see the retraining of all our teachers so that there's a shift from this teacher-centered approach and let's move into a learner-centered approach. And then I think also crucially that we start developing a growth mindset within the education sector at all levels. Um, because I sometimes think um, our teachers are so stuck, some of them are so stuck in their old mindset of doing things. So it's almost a case of it's, it's um, that's how they're gonna do it and they're gonna stick to that. And then I would also like to see an holistic, um, an emphasis placed on the holistic development of our learners, um, where sport, arts, and culture um, is open and accessible to all our boys and girls. And that should be coupled with good and excellent facilities, especially in our disadvantaged communities. And that should be non-negotiable. Um, I would also like to see that we, 
that the Department of Education from national and the provincial departments that they they spend less money on wealthier former Model C schools um, so that we can address and diminish this, this, this gap in terms of the haves and the have-nots. And then also to look at, and the, and the example I want to quote there is that there should be more teaching posts allocated to our disadvantaged schools where the need is greater. And um, we should also look at our norms and standards as far as the wealthier Model C schools. And if it is that we say you're not going to get norms and standards allocations allocation because we want to invest more into the disadvantaged schools, then that is a conversation that we need to start. And then the last point I want to make, um, Renee, is just to, to maybe just a word of caution. This pandemic, in my opinion, has really put the spotlight on all the structural flaws um, that we find within our education system. Um, and um, and the, the, the point I want to leave with is the following. Um, in the past, we used to speak about an injury to one is an injury to all. Now, now I, I'm, I get this very uneasy feeling that, um, that there are schools due to online learning and the fact that they are, are, um, are well off and the parents have all the resources. I get the feeling that there are schools come the 1st of June that they're going to fly. Okay, and there are schools in our townships and on our disadvantaged areas that are going to struggle. And I can tell you now, based on what I'm hearing and what I'm sensing, is that um, some schools, even your grade 11s, are so prepared that they're going to be writing the September mock exams. I mean, the question I'm asking is how many of our dis disadvantaged or township schools are going to be in that position? On the other side, you have the independent schools, who I also get the feeling is in a state of readiness to write their end of the year exam. So the, the question for me is, how does the Minister of Basic Education, how does she navigate through these two situations that, that I think is going to unfold? And I do think at some point, we're going to have to get together and we're gonna have to find a solution in order to make sure that no school and no learner is left behind. But if we do not address that, I do foresee a major challenge as the months go by. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much for closing us off on that note. Thanks, Ashley, Anushka, um, Bevel and Patricia in her absence for really sharing valuable insights. I think an important takeaway is how pre-existing inequalities are really showing up and even exacerbated during this time, but also what uh, potentials there are to dream about new systems. And there's so much to be done, so much to be addressed. So thank you so much for sharing um, your thoughts for everyone who tuned in. Thanks for your live comments and debates in the, in the chat stream. Um, we do have an email list that you can sign up to. Um, we, we don't spam you with email lists. We just send emails when there's an event. So you can find the details for that on our Facebook and Twitter page or also follow us on social media where we advertise our talks. I think there's been so much said here tonight that we can follow up on in next session. So please do uh, tune in again and contribute your, your thoughts. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.